So we're going to take a look at polynomials and what the laws of exponents are. So some terminology we have to go through, simplifying uh, polynomials, and then looking at the basic laws of exponents that you, you probably already know, um, but we might have to just quickly revisit to go over. So, let's look. so first, what is a constant? These are terms that you have to know in math class. What is a constant? What does that mean? And I'm not going to fill in everything. Write these down as we talk about them. Well, uh, the thickness stays the same. Okay, so the thing that stays the same is a constant. That's one way to think about it. Good. What else? Something that never changes no matter what. So it stays the same? Yeah. More specific, mathematically. In an equation, where or an equation or expression, what would a constant look like? The slope. The slope is a coefficient. We could call it a constant coefficient, but it's a coefficient really. Where are there constants in expressions? So if I had the expression 2x plus 7, 2x plus 7, 7, 7. 7 is not changing, there's no variable attached to it. The 2, if we're, again, for 2x plus 7, 2 is called a constant coefficient. Its number, 2, is constant, it's not changing. The x is a variable, it can change. But the 7 by itself, not attached to anything, not multiplying or dividing by anything, that itself is constant. So you're looking for a term that is simply a number. Okay, a term that itself is a number. How about the next one? Monomial. Use your prefix, obviously, in your roots, these. Monomial, what does that mean? What's a monomial? What does M-O-N-O -O mean? What does that prefix mean? One. It means one. Good. So how would you take that instead of polynomial and think about what a monomial is? What is a monomial? Alex? Um, with one variable. Close. You could have more than one variable in a monomial. For example, the quantity 2xy is a monomial. But the quantity 2xy plus 7 is not a monomial. It could be 2x squared y, and it's still a monomial. But 2x squared y plus 7 is not a monomial. One term. And a term is a grouping. So for example, for example, for a monomial, 2xy squared. That's a monomial because that's all one term. They're all multiplied by each other. But if I put a plus 7 on the end, then 2x squared y is one term, and the 7 is another term, and thus it would be a binomial then, right? Okay, a binomial. A binomial has two terms to it. A polynomial has many, three or more terms. Specifically, you could say trinomial. But after that, you would use polynomial. So one term, okay, one term. And a term, by the way, we, we, didn't, we don't define term here. It's something that you've done your whole life, but you don't use it often. A term is anything separated by a plus or minus sign, okay? So 2x squared y, all of those have multiplication signs in them. So that's all just one term. For there to be two terms involved, and I'll jump to a polynomial before I come back to the top. This. That would be a polynomial. Okay? Because it has many terms. How many? Specifically, three. The first term is 2xy squared. The second term is x squared. And the third term is simply three. So for these different uh, examples of vocabulary here, Make sure that your example makes sense and that you're writing down next to your example what's happening. So again, polynomial means many terms. You don't use anything besides monomial, binomial, trinomial, and then after that everything's polynomial. You don't use specific names for anything beyond the third degree.
So earlier, Inigo gave us the idea of the slope being a constant coefficient. So coefficient itself means, Morgan? It's a number before a variable. Yeah, the number, the number before a variable in a term. Okay, the number before a variable in a term. Now, this is the weird part. A coefficient does not necessarily have to be a number. Like, if you remember from one of your examples, you had to like solve for k in those problems. It was like kx plus 2y equals 7. And they gave you a point, you had to find out what k was. Well, k, although it looked like a variable, was actually a, uh, it was a coefficient. It was kx, like for example here, I'll draw it down at the bottom what I'm saying. Remember we did this earlier in the year? And part of the problem would say like, if the point 1, 2 is on the curve, find the value of k. Well, you plugged in 1 and 2 for x and y, and you determined what k was. So k is a coefficient here. Again, recognize that, please. k is definitely a coefficient still here. Yes? Um, how do you know if it's k or x? Because, well, it's based on the context of the problem. If you're just given a statement and you don't know any better, then yeah, you would know. You would not know at all. You're definitely not. But based on the context of the problem, if you're determining the value of k and this is representing a straight line, it's definitely the coefficient, whereas x is the independent variable and y is the dependent variable. But yeah, if you were given something like k, x, y squared, b, like you would not know if any of those are really coefficients or any of those are variables. You have to know the context of the problem. Um, so sometimes you solve for coefficients. That's what I'm saying, really. Sometimes part of the process of the problem is to figure out what is the coefficient. So when we get to quadratics, when we get to quadratics, we're going to have this. All right, there's our standard form for quadratics. Ax squared plus bx plus c. A, b, and c are all what? Have you done quadratics in middle school at all? Did you start parabolas? Maybe, maybe not. Is this some yes, some no? Do you remember A, B, and C? What were they always? What? I don't know an answer. I mean, a generic term for it. Yeah, A, B, and C are your coefficients. Okay? When you're looking at quadratics, the values of A, B, and C indicate the actual graph's behavior. So a higher A value means the graph is steep. A negative A value means the graph opens down. The C value indicates the y intercept. So A, B, and C are coefficients here, but when you write it out, you write it like this. This is standard form for a quadratic, but A, B, and C are usually numbers. So it's like 2x squared plus 3x plus 7. Okay, so A, B, and C are constant coefficients. They're just coefficients in general. Uh, how about like terms? Like terms. What are like terms? You've used that before. You say combine like terms. You had it. Two terms with the same, not coefficient. Like variable. variable portion. The coefficient doesn't matter. That's the whole idea. 2x plus 3x is 5x, isn't it? Those coefficients, 2 and 3, are very different, aren't they? It's the variable part. So two terms with the same variable component. Two terms with the same variable component. So for example, if I had this, 2xy squared plus 4xy squared, that would equal 6xy squared. Okay, to show you an example with like terms. It doesn't have to be just x. It could be xy squared a, b, c, d to the fifth. And if the other one is xy squared a, b, c, d to the fifth, it's still the same variable term. The variable could have 10 parts to it. It doesn't make a difference. But if the same variable portion is the same for both terms, those are then like terms. When you have like terms, remember, you can multiply or subtract them by simply looking at their coefficients. All you have to alter is the coefficients. 2 plus 4 gives us 6. That's all that we altered here. We did not touch xy squared. We just carried that over the whole way. It's the 2 plus the 4 that gave us this 6. It's the coefficients 
that matter when combining like terms. Assuming, obviously, that they are indeed like terms. Uh, we did polynomial. How about the degree? The degree of a variable. How about the degree? What do you know as degree? There's another word for it. Yeah, okay. It's the actual uh, exponent of the variable, the degree. So, for example, if you had something like, I don't know, 3x squared, the degree is simply 2. The degree is simply 2. How about the degree of a monomial? How about the degree of a monomial? For example, if I had so for the degree of a monomial, what you want to do is take a look at all the different factors in that term. So for example, if we have 3x squared, y to the fourth, z to the fifth, the degree of the overall monomial would be the sum of those degrees. So x's degree is 2, y's degree is 4, z's degree is 5. 2 plus 4 plus 5 gives us a degree, in this case, of 11. Um, the degree of an overall polynomial is taking all of the monomials individually and finding the, top, the highest of those degrees. So for example, if you had 3x squared y plus 2y to the fifth minus z squared y, you can clearly see that the degree of this monomial is 3 from the 2 plus the 1 that's here. The degree of this is 5. And the degree of this is also 3, from the 2 here plus the 1 that should be really here. So the overall degree of the polynomial in this case would be 5. So simplify. It should be pretty straightforward. Arrange terms in decreasing degree of x. Okay, in decreasing degree of x. Then determine the degree of each polynomial. So, obviously with the first one, the like, like terms first, practice so on your own, collect your like terms, simplify it, put it in decreasing degree of x, so highest degree to lowest degree. So the first one we're going to recognize right away that we have like terms, the 3x minus 5x is going to give us a negative 2x. Then I have a negative x squared and a positive 4x squared, which gives me 3x squared. And then finally, I've got the negative 9 and the positive 2 gives me negative 7. Is that in the correct order? Inigo? Okay, and again, does this really matter? Absolutely not. It really makes no difference later on. The important part of putting this in the correct order is that sometimes you come up with formulas that use the coefficients if they're in the correct order. Like, for example, the leading coefficient, 3, has a huge effect on the graph of a problem. So it's important to put it in order so that you can visualize it. That's the only reason you do this. It's not to make you just do more work. It's not so like, oh, why don't I put it in order? It's the same thing, really. And yeah, it absolutely is the same thing. Okay, but if it's important to recognize that the leading coefficient is a certain value, you probably want it in the correct order so you can see the leading coefficient right away. Part B. Look for your like terms right away. 
x squared, y squared doesn't show up anywhere except once, so there's no like terms for that. Then I go to the x, y to the fourth. These are the same like terms right here and right here. So combine those two first. Negative 8 x, y to the fourth. Positive 2 x, y to the fourth is going to give me negative 6 x, y to the fourth. Okay, so remember to start with your actual coefficients as the things you're going to combine. Then we'll take a look and notice that we've got 5x to the third, y to the third, negative 1x to the third, y to the third. 5 minus 1 gives me 4x to the third, y to the third. And then last but not least here, we've got these last two terms, both of which have no like terms to combine with. So I can carry them down, x squared, y squared and 2x to the fourth y. Now if I wanted to write this in decreasing degree, decreasing degree according to x, what would this one look like? What would this one look like? Decreasing degree in order of x. Just in order of x. In order of x. The first term will be 4x cubed, y cubed. How come? Because they have the larger um, um, exponent of x. Does it have the largest though? No, no, 2x. There it is. So go ahead. 2x um, y plus 4x cubed, y cubed. Good. Okay, so in decreasing order of x's degree, it would look like that. In decreasing order of x's degree, it would look like that. Um, all right, let's move on to the next problem. So for this one, you're finding the sum and difference between two things. When you find the difference between two terms, or two expressions rather, you have to consider all of those terms being negative, right? So if you want the difference between 6y cubed plus 2y minus 5 and the other part, you have to subtract all of those portions. So this should be quick. You should be able to do this in like 15, 20 seconds per problem. Okay, identify like terms, find the sum of the first one. Identify like terms, find the difference of the second one. Check the first one, please, before you go on to the second one. Make sure it's right. The second one, consider the fact that it's a difference now and no longer a sum. Okay, we can add a difference for the second one and not a sum. Remember that the definition of subtraction is adding the opposite. So you could simply make this a plus in the middle, like that, and switch all of your signs. Make that a negative, make that a negative, make that a positive, make that a negative. Okay, or you could just literally subtract them, very simply. Sometimes it helps people to see that though. So I've got 6y cubed 
negative 2y cubed is a 4y cubed. I've got negative y squared, nothing else on the other side. I've got a 2y and a positive y is 3y. And then I've got a negative 5 and a negative 2 yielding negative 7. Okay, this should be at some point, I've seen this before, right? With like terms, combining like terms, adding, subtracting polynomials. Should be a lot of review so far. If you notice, the beginning of every chapter in this book is like a little bit of review from like your basic algebra, and then as the chapter goes on, it gets into more. So we're just Yeah, I would always order things from highest degree to lowest, no matter what, even in science, in any class, when you're looking at things, because the thing with the highest degree has the most effect on the function. So you always put it first. And the leading coefficient indicates a lot about the function. Whether this is positive or negative, it tells you a ton about the sheep and the graph. Okay? So yes, that's a good point, I think. Okay, even if it doesn't say so, you should really just list things from highest to lowest degree. Just get used to it. Okay, it makes life a lot easier for you, especially because it's like... Uh, it's like a standardized form, you know what I mean? Like, all, across all math and science, people are going to write things from a high to low degree. So, although you could write it the other way, and it would still be right, if you want to be difficult, you can. But why not be, you know, have some conformity so that you have a language that's... We talked about this the other day, I mean, Mr. Joseph, it's a language, like math in general, is a language that's acceptable by all, in any language, you know what I mean? It doesn't matter what you're speaking. If you write things the right way, it's the same whether you speak English, Spanish, Italian... Math is math, right? The numbers themselves. So try to keep things in some standardized form here so that they're same across all. How about this one? Again, simplification. Check your intermediate step before you go further, please. When you're done distributing, check to see what you have before going any further. Keeping in mind that the negative 3y, that negative sign is to be distributed to both. So if your signs are wrong here, that is very important that you change them. And notice I use xy, like 3xy instead of 3yx. You can do that too, it's the same thing. Any question about the distribution process there? Does everybody have on the board at least what I have so far? If you don't, please ask questions. I'd rather you ask now than, than hold them back later, until later, and then, you know, it's get more, a lot more complex later. Now, combining like terms, I'm going to notice that I've got a 4xy, and some of you probably wrote this as negative 3yx, but those are like terms. Again, if you wrote this instead, if you wrote this as negative 3yx, that's, I understand why you did that, because it's a negative 3y times x. But this is the same like term as this, because they both have the same variable component. So you just do the 4 minus the 3, which gives you 1xy. And you don't have to write the 1, obviously, right? The next like term is what? The next like term. Well, negative 6x, positive 4x gives me negative 2x. M, the last one. Now, for a problem like this, obviously, we're going to take a look at this and see that we have several things going on. First, two of these terms have degrees of 1. One of these terms has a degree of 2. It's two parts. The... The part in the beginning that's x times y here, you can leave that as your leading, point for your, your leading part, portion because it has both variable terms. Um, but the idea of x times y means that this function would be a nonlinear function, actually. So we're going to talk about these at one point during the year where x gets multiplied by y. 
and just write a little note down that this is a nonlinear, okay, nonlinear function. So I want your input on this one. This one's not easy. It's just taking what we looked at and really applying it to like an honors level math course. Take a look at this problem and maybe work with the person next to you or work on your own. Think about what you can do. Troubleshoot this for a little while. Don't just, I don't want to, I don't want to go through the process of this too quickly. Troubleshoot it. Keeping in mind that A, B, and C are going to be numbers. A, B, and C in the end are going to be numbers. I'm going to recommend that you don't move things over to the other side of the equation. Okay? Don't move things, you can combine like terms on the left hand side, but don't move things from one side of the equation to the other. It'll make it harder actually in the end. I would recommend not moving anything. It'll make it a lot easier. See, take a look at what I've done so far. X squared and X squared, that's easy, right? 2x squared, obviously. Then the terms that have X, I group together. Right? These both have X in them, I group those together. And then the terms that are just constants, for example, 2B and 3A, those are constants, because A and B are numbers, remember? A and B are numbers. I group those together. How could this help me? How could this help me? What does an equal sign mean? Literally, what does an equal sign mean? They both have the same value. Yeah, both expressions have the same value. So as a result, Chandler, could you tell me what C is just by inspection? Uh, number. What is it? Literally. It's a function. Good. And give me the actual value. It's easier than it looks. I'm putting you on the spot, I know. Oh, two. Two. How come? Oh, because two x squared on the left side. Yeah, if, if you have x squared on the left side, and you have x squared on the right side, the c must be two. This is called equating coefficients. c must be two, because they're both on both sides of the equation, and they both are coefficients. Now, here's the trickier part, though, right? Look in red now. Look at the text in red. What could I factor out of that? I'm going to recopy this. What could I factor out of what's in red? X. And if I factor X out, what am I left with if I factor an X out? What am I left with as a coefficient for X if I factor X out? Do we know how to factor things out yet? Uh, we haven't gone over it, that's why. Is there? A minus 2B. Make sense of this? If you were to redistribute the x, right? This becomes a negative 2bx, that's here. This becomes ax, that's here. So remember when you factor something out, just decrease its degree by 1. 
So this becomes x to the 0, it goes away, it becomes a 1. This becomes x to the 0, it becomes just simply a 1. Okay, so divide by x, divide by x. That's an easy way to think about when you factor something out. Mathematically, think about dividing by it. Those both cancel, which is what brings the x out in front there. How about the last part? There's nothing to factor out, unfortunately. But I'm going to write it like this, still. Can somebody else help me out to continue this problem? Besides the fact that c is equal to 2, what else can I write? C is definitely 2. Chandler got us that earlier. Will? Yeah, a minus 2b has to be equal to whatever's in the coefficient of x over here, which is negative 7. Again, the coefficient of x on the left-hand side here must equal the coefficient of x on the right-hand side, so a minus 2b is definitely negative 7. James, the last part. We got this, 2 equals c. We got this equals 7. Yep, and what is that going to equal on the left-hand side? Yeah, it's kind of the only thing left, right, even if you didn't know, but the idea here is that 2b plus 3a is a number, isn't it? If a and b were numbers, this quantity is the constant at the end. Well, c, uh, 3, 3 is the constant at the end over here. Usually you call this a c, right? This is a and c. So 3, the constant on one side, is equal to 2b plus 3a, the constant on the other side. How are you going to solve this? How are you going to find a and b? Quick, come on. Quickest way to solve. Always encourage you to use this, whatever you can. Yeah, but what should you, instead of doing it by hand, how should you use elimination? Yeah, use the matrix method to do this. Okay? Go ahead and solve. Very easy on your matrix. Go ahead and do it, please. There's your entry matrix I already wrote for you. So enter that matrix, please. Let's see what you get for A and B. Again, simply watching us do this right is not enough, so make sure you're practicing. So if you have your calculator, which you should, for all reasons that we always talk about, please get it out and practice this. You should be able to do math by yourself, obviously, right? But you can check everything on your calculator, at least. <coughs> Remember to enter this into matrix A, then quit out, then go back into matrix, and go over to, what is it, edit, I think, or something like that, the second column title, and go down, math, thank you, go to math, and then go down to RREF. So on your home screen right now, you should have this. It's going to open like that when you do REF on your home screen. Then go back into the matrix and hit enter on the matrix that you input earlier. So maybe matrix A. Okay, and then hit enter. This will give you a result that has ones and zeros in the pivots, or ones in the pivots and zeros everywhere else, rather. Pivots are the diagonal. Pivot the diagonal this way. So if you have a 3 by 3 over here, right, you have three of these like this, you have ones down the pivot or down the diagonal. What do you get with those two values when you do this? What do you get? Is everybody else getting a really long decimal? Yeah. So you know you press, hit math, and then hit convert to fraction. Hit math, and then hit the button that says convert to fraction. Did it convert to fraction for you? Okay. 
Whenever that happens, you get a long decimal, there's a good chance that it is rational and there is a fractional representation of it. So just hit math, enter, enter, and it converts it to a fraction every time. What do you got, sir? Now, which is which? Which is A, which is B? How do you remember? What do you, what do you look to remember which is A and which is B? Well? Yeah, so here was A. And this is what Will is saying here. He's recognized. Oh, wait, did I? Uh -huh. What did I do wrong? Yeah, so go back and check. Fix yours. These should have been switched. I apologize. See, I went too quick for myself. A's need to be aligned. This is B and D, right? So switch these two. Those two should be switched in your matrix, and you should recalculate it. But anyway, this column should have been A, that should have been B. So this answer wound up being A, because it comes from this column, right? And then this answer wound up being B. So I want number 26 from the homework. So you have AX cubed minus 2X cubed. How do I write that? If I had 7X cubed minus 2X cubed, 7 minus 2 is simply 5. It's, it's pretty easy to know that, right? But if it's AX cubed minus 2X cubed, how do I write that? A minus 2, A minus two in parentheses, X cubed. Because that's what I would do. Think about this. Replace this, please. In your mind, replace this with a 7. You would do 7X cubed minus 2X cubed. You would do 7 minus 2. So you're really doing A minus 2. So when I'm rewriting this down here, it's going to be A minus 2 X cubed. Yes, I'll have an equals at the end, and it'll equal this whole thing again. Okay, but I'm going to collect all my terms. So that's my x cubes. How about x squareds? I'm going to have negative 3x squared minus, C, minus negative cx squared. Sarah? And let's go over that. It'd be negative 3 minus negative c. So it's negative 3 minus a negative is a positive, and since the negative 3 and the negative c are both here for x squared, they both come out front. What else? The next one. The next one. How about the linear term with just x there? So looking at this, and looking at this, what would that one be? Remember, if this were a number, you would say like 8x minus negative 5x. 8 minus negative 5 is 13. So you're looking at this and this again. Indigo. 2b minus 5 on both times cubed. I made one mistake. Plus. Why? Because you're subtracting a negative. Yeah, subtract a negative is a positive. That's a plus 5 there. And then finally at the end, you've got a negative 2, and you've got minus a negative 4D. So this end part is going to be, and I'm going to put it like this again, negative 2, right, negative 2, minus negative, so it's positive, 4D. So negative 2 plus 4D. Okay, then you would just have to use a matrix again to solve this. Now, let's write this out. You've got A minus 2 is equal to 0 for sure. Why can I write that? Why can I write that a minus 2 is equal to 0? Sarah? Because there's no uh, x cubed in the actual On the right-hand side. Yeah. Well, let's not say answer. Let's say right-hand side. It's an equation. There's no answer. So on the right-hand side of the equation, you're missing the x cubed term, which means it's really 0 x cubed. So if there's 0 x cubed on the right, and a minus 2 x cubed on the left, that means that a minus 2 has to be equal to 0. So what can you conclude automatically? a equals? Anybody? Thank you. Good. Okay, too simple, right? You can just answer out loud. That's fine. So a is 2 from that part. Then we go to the next part, and we see that we have a negative 3 plus c. 
And that equals the coefficient of x squared, which is 1. Therefore, we can find c. Actually, we don't need a matrix, do we? We can add the 3 over, giving us c equals 4. Next, next. We then look here. 2b plus 5, right? That's the coefficient of x. Well, the coefficient of x over here is, again, 1. So we have 2b plus 5 equal 1. We're going to subtract the 5, making that a negative 4. Divide by 2, so it's negative 2. And then last but not least, the constant terms. Negative 2 plus 4d is equal to negative 6, really, over here. Add the 2 to both sides, makes this a negative 4. Divide by 4 makes it negative 1. Okay? So, uh, a little bit easier because you didn't need a matrix, right? But if you had, like, several equations that you couldn't solve because there were multiple variables in each equation, just simply use a matrix to solve. All right, good question, Jen. Good question. Not an easy one, for sure. All right, let's look at the next slide now. Take a look at our just properties of exponents. Now, a lot of these I'm hoping you know already, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure to show you where they come from as we do them. Okay? So, the first one, a to the b times a to the c. Can somebody prove this? Give me an example that would prove this true. Give me an example that would prove it true. Doesn't matter what it is. Make the base obviously a variable and make the exponent a number. So, tell me what you want to use. Make the base an exponent. Uh, make the base a variable. So x squared. Okay. And that equals what? Good. JJ borrowed them last period, I think, for chemistry. That's probably all of them right there. Why don't a few of you guys help Ms. Myers real quick? Can I have them over? I just borrowed two of you. Oh, yeah, no problem. Um, okay, so we have x cubed, uh, x squared times x cubed is x to the fifth. Why is it not x to the sixth? Why is it x to the sixth? It looks like me on times, and I see a two and a three, so I think six, right? Why not? Yeah, why? What's x squared, really, Em? Good. And then what's x cubed? Yeah, so look at that. How many end up? Five of them, right? Five of them. <coughs> now, you could prove this true with numbers as well, but just to show you where it comes from with equations, okay? Uh, with variables. So you take a look at what you're doing here. You don't necessarily memorize every single rule. You understand the rules. They're very different. Okay, in middle school, your teacher a lot of times teach you memorize this. It'll work. It'll work. But think about why it works when you're in doubt. If you forgot that you should have added these and you multiplied them, well, check your work. X squared is really x times x, as I really said. X to the third is x times x times x. There's only five of them there as a result. The rule is not multiply. The rule is to add. Yes, sir? Uh, it depends on if they're plugged in. It looks like the one over here that an ego's sitting at is plugged in. Um, let's see if this one is over here. No, but if you want to grab the seat next to an ego to plug in. All right, second one, zero exponent. Anybody know how to do this one? Anybody ever seen the proof of where this comes from? Why is anything to the zero one? You've learned that before, right? Like five to the zero is one, or two to the zero is one. Tell me they don't fit next to each other. Really? Yeah. I can plug this one in. You don't mind, Anigo? Thanks, Wait, is that one plugged in? Is the one J Just look on the ground. That's what you got to do. No. Yeah, the problem is they move these desks for the open house, so they unplug all the tables, and unless somebody uh, actually goes around plugging each one individually, they're not going to get plugged in. Actually, yeah, Morgan, just sit on this side. Okay. All right, so for the second one, how can we prove that this is true, the zero exponent? Why is the zero exponent equal to 1? Why is the zero exponent equal to 1? Here, try this. Try this writing it down, please. Write down 2 to the 5th. 
Write down two to the fifth. What's two to the fifth? Sarah? 32. Okay, next, write down two to the fourth. What is it? What's two to the fourth? 16. You should know how to write, do powers of two, two times two times, etc. What's two to the third? Two to the second. Two to the first. All right, well, two to the zero, if you continue the pattern, has to be simply one. Look at the pattern. What are you doing every time? You're taking your result, 32, divided by two, right? Divide 32 by two, you get to 16. Divide 16 by 2, you get to 8. 8 divided by 2 gives you 4. 4 divided by 2 gives you 2. Well, 2 divided by 2 gives you just simply 1. Okay, so this is always going to be 1. Any, it works with any number. You can do this with powers of 3. Okay, but anything to the 0 is indeed 1. Power to a power. Power to a power, number 3. Who can explain power to a power? Give me an example of a to the b to the c. What do you got? Um, Give me, remember, like you did last time, same thing. Variable as a base. X squared. To the? To the fifth. Fifth? Yeah. Okay. What is x squared to the fifth? What's the answer? X to the tenth, because 2 times 5 is 10, right? How do you write it out to prove that this is true? If something is to the fifth, don't you write it five times? So isn't this really writing x squared five times? And then based on rule number one, you know that you have to add the exponents. So this just becomes x to the tenth. So instead of adding the exponents five times, you just remember the rule. Multiply five times two, that gives you ten. But again, reasoning as to why these rules are what they are. So you should never get one of these things wrong because you could always write it out. I'm not going to say this a lot, but like when in doubt, just simply write it out. Okay, Mr. Donachek always does when in doubt, factor out. Uh, there's a few others that I've heard. It's not something you should always do, but in this case, right, when in doubt with exponent rules, just write it out. Literally write the whole thing out. How about the, pro the power of a product? This one's a little bit tricky. It's not easy to prove this one is makes sense. What is the rule saying, though? Can somebody explain what the rule is saying? Power of a product. What does the rule actually say? Yeah. This thing is like being kind of distributed to both of the numbers. Yes, very good. And it's it's, it's annoying. I mean, I agree with God. Use the same word. It doesn't mean distributive with like distributive property where you multiply it out, but it really is like it's distributed, right? The C pretty much gets distributed in a sense to both of the terms, assuming or factors, not terms. There's only one term here. A, B is a single term. It has two factors. Remember the terminology we used yesterday? So the C gets distributed to both factors. Now, it's not easy to prove this with variables. It actually, you really can't show it with variables. You show it with numbers, though. Okay? So let's say we've got 2 times 4 to the second. Based on your rules of arithmetic, you do PEMDAS. So you'd start with parentheses. What's 2 times 4, simply? 8 squared is? 64. Okay, so that's the answer, right? Well, just distribute the 2 instead. Do it this way now. Do it the way we showed. Put the 2 to both of these instead. 2 squared is 4. 4 squared is 16. Still giving you 64. So this proof is by using an example. It's not an algebraic. So 2 squared times 4 squared, 2 squared is a 4, 4 squared is a 16, 4 times 16 is 64. The same answer you get whether you do it first or distribute. Okay, so you can use the word distribute here, but just recognize that you're not, it's not the distributive property. Okay, it's not the distributive property, but the word distribute is fine. You could say associate the exponent with every factor, whatever you want to do. Okay, raise every factor to that power. So we're going to look at examples, and now suddenly we went from easy examples, right, with numbers that we just did. Those are pretty simple, to now ones where we have variables also. 
So the first one, part A. How would I approach part A? Who could step me through this? What would I do? And do it one step at a time. One step at a time. I'll give you a minute because I see a lot of you actually doing it. So do it yourself first. It's fine. Then we'll go over it. Think about a squared to the k. A power to a power. The rule is to multiply those powers. Did most of you get that so far? A to the second to the k, the 2 times the k is 2k. A to the k to the third is really k times 3, or 3k. What do you do when you have the same base? What do you do to the exponents? You add them. So what's the answer, Alex? Okay. Same exact rules we just learned, but now simply applying those rules. Part B, part B. That one's a little bit trickier. What do you have to start with in part B? What do you have to actually do? Yeah. Yeah, please start by distributing what's out in front of both terms. So this becomes x to the m minus n times x to the m plus n plus x to the m minus n times x to the n. So by distributing, that's when you get to start. I'm not actually multiplying it out just yet. I'm just showing the work. Now, we recognize that we have the same base. So when you have the same base, you add the exponents. So m minus n plus m plus n becomes what? What does this become as an exponent? Nigo? X to the? Yeah, 2m. Is it you said 2m the first time? Okay, x to the 2m. And I get that because simply add this to this. The n's cancel. One's negative, one's positive. Those cancel off. m plus m is 2m. There's still a plus sign in the middle. On the right-hand side, x to the m minus n times x to the n. Again, add the exponents. Add this to this. x to the m. The n's cancel again. Can I combine these last two? Some of you shook your head yes. Some of you said no. What is it? I don't think you can. Why not? Because what you're saying is x times a number subtracted by another number. And when you add the x times like the second, it's not going to make sense if I say it more. Well, there's a way to make sense of it, though. You could make a simple statement. There's a simpler statement, and you're, you're making it more complicated than it is. Pick a number for m. 2. Okay, so you would have then x to the fourth plus x to the second, right? Are those like terms? x to the fourth and x to the second are not like terms. Remember, like terms, like terms, right? You combine like terms we talked about, have the same variable component. That was our definition of a like term. This is x to the 2m, this is x to the m, these are different variable components. And what I mean by variable components is that they'd have to have the same exponent to add them. Like x squared plus x squared is 2x squared. 2x squared plus 5x squared is 7x squared. Because those exponents were all the same, we were able to add them. These exponents are not the same. Yes? There is. There absolutely is. Put it there. In front of the M, you want to put a 1 right here? Are the exponents the same though? Think about a number, right? Put a number in for m. If you put a 3 in for m, this becomes x to the 6th plus x to the 3rd. You can't combine those, can you? So you can't combine these. Okay? When you're down there, just think about put a, putting a number in. Could you actually simplify that properly? Uh, start up on your homework. Okay? Start up on your 4-2 homework as practice. So you have a little bit of time. Hopefully you can get it done. So over the break, you have no work to do for math. Maybe you could catch up on maybe old homework you missed in my class or get a head start on the problem set. Okay, keep that in mind. It's going to be due the day before the test. So, what's the test again? 
Test the fourth, so the third. Okay. Uh, over the break, I'm going to definitely, remember I was telling you yesterday, finish up your quarter two project. So I'm going to send it out to you over the break. Okay, so if you get an email and you want to get a head start on it, you can do that, but you can also just wait until Monday and we'll talk, or Tuesday and we'll talk about it then. I had a question I was going to ask you about. It was about three minutes.